Hey folks, today in lab four, we are going to look at overriding inheritance and how to generate UML diagrams and what they're all about. So the basic idea today is you can have one class which may have some attributes and some methods in it, and then you can have a child of that class which will inherit all of those abilities from the parent, and then you can modify uh, the things that you need to modify as the child, and that's called inheritance and overriding of methods. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off today in Visual Studio as a normal, and I'm going to go ahead and create a couple of different classes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off and I'm going to say add class, and this class that I'm going to add is going to be a person. All right, so for a class person, we're going to give it a couple of attributes. So all people generally have names, so I'm going to say public string name, and I'm going to give them an age. I'm going to make that private, so private int age, and a person would have a daily routine. So let's say public void daily routine. And what we're going to do is we're going to say console.writeline wake up. And then we have um, watch cartoons. And then we have eat. And finally, sleep. All right. So this is everybody's daily routine, apparently. All right, so, so far, nothing new here. I've just created a class. It has a name. It has an age. I've made the name public. I've made the age private. And then I have this daily routine. So let's talk about what does this public private mean with regard to this. So I'm going to go over to my main class, and I'm going to go ahead and create myself a person. So I'm going to say person p1 equals new person. And then I'm going to attempt to change their name. So p1.name is equal to enda, and that seems like that worked fine. p1.age is equal to 15. Okay, now you can see that it underlined age, and it says this is a read-only number. Age is inaccessible due to its protection level. And that's because I don't have the ability to make a change to something that's private in an object that I'm creating of a class. So how would I ever set that age? Well, I need setters and getters. So I would probably have something like a public void set age, which takes in a new age, and it simply says age equals new age. All right, and then if I want to get the age, I would probably have some kind of public int new uh, get age, and that would return age. All right, now you might say, well, that seems silly, like you're just doing all this extra work. But realistically, you know that an age should be limited in what it should be. So if the new age is greater than, let's say, 150, say, mm, oops, why are you doing this? Because I'm in the wrong language. <laughs> right? And so we can put in limitations that stop folks from setting the age to things that aren't really possible. We could likewise have um, something that checks to see if the age is too low. So for example, if new age is less than zero, we know that that's not possible either. And maybe we would warn the person with something about the age being too, yo or too low in that case. All right, so that's why we have getters and setters. They allow us to control what's happening with an attribute, and they make sure that the attribute isn't getting changed randomly in a way that doesn't make any sense. All right, so our person class here looks fairly decent. We have our name, we have our age, we have some getters and setters, and we have a daily routine. So now we're gonna look at making a student. A student has all of the capabilities of a person. It's just that in addition to the capabilities of the person, they also have some other things like they know how to study and go to class, and they maybe have a KSU ID. So we would say that each a student is a child of person. So I'm gonna go ahead and add another class, and this time I'm going to call it student. And inside of student, I'm going to say colon person. All right, so student is now a child of person. So without doing anything else, I'm going to go back over to my main method, and I'm going to create myself a student. Um, so I'm not able to do p1.h. We spoke about that from just a moment ago, so I'm going to go ahead and remove that. All right, so I'm going to say student s1 equals new student. And now I'm able to do that. What's interesting is I can now immediately say s1.name equals Jane. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Student has literally nothing in it. 
there's I never put a name in there. So why am I suddenly able to access the name on student? Well, the answer is because student is a child of person and person has a public name. Therefore, student has a public name. You don't have to write it in here. As a matter of fact, it's wrong to write it in here. You don't want two separate attributes, one that's in the child and one that's in the parent with the same name. That's not a good plan. So this is something you inherited from your parent and you have the ability to use. What's also interesting is down here in main, I would be able to say s1 dot daily routine. Now, this is again weird because I'm calling daily routine when there is no daily routine defined inside of student. But I'm able to do that because daily routine is in parent and I inherited it as a student. So if I run this code right now, what I'm going to see is that I'm going to get the daily routine from the parent. Wake up, watch cartoons, eat, sleep, and then I get a hello world because that's down there and I didn't remove it. Um, so this is what inheritance does. It gives you all of the capabilities of the parent and allows you to use them even though you don't have to redefine them. And it allows for us to create chains of classes that are connected to each other where all of the properties and all of the methods are carried forward from the first class down to later classes. All right, what happens if this child doesn't like the daily routine? You may not want to do exactly the same thing as your parent. Well, you have the option in the child of overwriting what you got from the parent. So let's take a look at the parent's definition, which was daily routine and it was a void. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say public override void daily routine. Now, it's not directly going to let me do this, and I'm going to come back and explain why in a moment, but I'm first off going to write the definition. So I'll write line of what the child, the child, so what does a student do? So we still wake up, that makes sense, but then we're going to hopefully study and maybe go to class. And eventually eat and sleep. Colon. All right, so the student is doing something quite different. Now, why is it underlining this? Well, this is an intricacy of C sharp. When you have a method in a parent, if you want the child to be able to override it, you're going to put in the word virtual. And this says that I'm okay with the child overriding this. If this word virtual is not there, the child is not permitted to change it. So this is a way for the parent to enforce that I want everybody to do it this way, or I want this to be the default, and then if anybody needs to change it, they're allowed to change it. So it's the difference of the word virtual in there. So if I run this, now what I'm getting from my main method, and if I go back and just pull up the main method, notice that I'm calling s1.dailyroutine, where s1 is the student, the daily routine that I'm getting is the student's daily routine, which includes study, go to class, and eat. By comparison, if I do p1.daily routine, I'm, I'm just going to put in a, um, a console.write line so that we can tell the difference between which one was the parents and which one was the child's. Um, I'm going to run this again, and what you're going to see is there's the parent's version of daily routine, and there's the child's version. So the child has successfully changed the definition. All right, so the important parts of all of this are you can have a class, it can have attributes and methods. None of that is new today. But if a an attribute or a method is marked as public, then a child of that will automatically inherit those attributes and those methods, and the child can change and alter any of them. Um, if the parent has the has a method that is public and they want the child to be able to override it, then you're going to put in the word virtual into the method to say that the parent is okay with the child overriding if they want to. All right, so there can be more than one level of um, inheritance. So I'm going to add another class, and this one I'm going to call undergrad. So there's my undergrad class, and I'm going to say that it extends, or it is inheriting from student. All right, so notice that I'm not inheriting from person, I'm inheriting from student. So now we have person at the top, and then we have student, and then we have undergrad down below that. So we have three layers at this point. And an undergrad may have certain things that they 
need whatever attributes and uh, methods they have. They inherit everything that student has and everything that par person has because it propagates all the way down. So as long as the parent marked it as public or the student marked it as public, the undergrad gets access to all of that as well. All right, I'm going to make one more class in here just to show that you can have more than one um, child of a given class. And this one's going to be employee. All right, and so employees are also people. They're not necessarily um, students or undergrads. And then they could have their own set of attributes and their own set of classes as well. And so you can see how quickly you could build trees of classes that inherit from each other and gain abilities from above. Um, and so that's the whole idea of inheritance. It allows you to take something, write it once at the top, get it correct, and then have all of the classes underneath that successfully be able to use that and or modify it if necessary. All right, so that's the first topic in today's um, lab. The second topic is that you're going to generate a UML diagram. Um, in Visual Studio, you're going to have to install a plugin. So what you're going to want to do is start the Visual Studio um, installer and that's going to open up a separate window like this make sure that you have saved your project as a matter of fact you're probably going to want to close visual studio before you do these steps so i'm going to go ahead and save all of that um, all right so inside of visual studio installer you're going to hit the modify button and then inside of modify you're going to move over to individual components and you're going to look for class designer um, this is already checked because I've already been through it, but on your machine, it may or may not be. You're going to check that. It's going to install it. It's going to take a few minutes to do that install. And then once you're done, it adds in a new capability into Visual Studio. So when you start Visual Studio back up again, um, which I'm going to close that window, I'm going to open Lab 4 again. What I'm going to do is over on the site where I added in the classes, I've always been right-clicking on my, the name of my project and I've been hitting Add. I've always been hitting class, but this time I'm going to say new item. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for um, class diagram. It's actually right there. All right, and then I'm going to hit add. So this is going to add in, in addition to all of my .cs files, I now have a class diagram.cd. And right now it's going to be blank. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of my classes that I have created, and I'm going to drag them over here, and I'm going to drop them in. So the first one I'm going to drop in is person, and then I'm going to drop in student. Let me move that over just a little bit. I'm going to drop in undergrad, and I'm going to drop in, uh, what's the other one? Employee, person, program, I guess. Okay, so you'll notice that as I dropped them in, it automatically went ahead and drew these lines on there. Um, those lines show the information about that, um, that person or that student or that employee. And the other thing is that there's a little drop down arrow on each of them. And if you click that, it's going to show you some additional information about that class. All right, so what we've done here is this is a diagram that just shows the relationship between all of the different classes that I have made. And you might think, okay, well, this seems stupid. I know what classes I made. I'm the one who coded them. But if you work in a company, you're generally going to have hundreds, if not thousands of these classes. And it's quite hard to keep track in your head which things are related to which things. So a UML diagram, which is what this has created for us, is a quick and easy way for you to be able to tell which things are related to which things and see it graphically. Quite often, these are printed out and hung on the walls in offices. And when people have meetings, they might stand near the diagram so that they can point at things and remember how they're related to each other. So what each one of these uh, little boxes is telling you, each box represents a class. And so you can see that this class has two fields age and name. You can see there's a little padlock next to age because it's private, whereas name does not have the padlock because it's public. It also shows you there are three methods in here, daily routine, get age, and set age. And then we can see student is a child of person. We can see employee is a child of person. And we can see that employee has no attributes or methods of its own. It just inherits them. It doesn't redraw all the things that it inherited from the parent because that would become overwhelming. It only draws things that were changed. So for example, in student, I can see that there's a daily routine in the parent and in the student. Therefore, I know that this is an override of that one. And indeed, when I mouse over it, it shows me it's a public override of daily routine. And then I see undergrad and so on. As you make changes in your code, this diagram will now update.
It's actually also possible to do it the other way. If I needed to bring in a graduate student, I can actually drag in class from the side here. I was just grabbing class and dragging it in. And I'm going to call it grad student. And when I pop that in there, you can see it automatically adds it to the diagram. But what's interesting is when I double click it, I can then say extends um, student. And if I now go back to my uh, diagram, you see that it drew that in. And as I make changes, it allows me to see those changes directly, which is pretty cool. So that's how you generate a UML diagram. Uh, for today's lab, you're going to be exporting that diagram. Um, it's sitting here in your list of classes. So here are all your CS files for all of your individual class files. And you also will have a class diagram.cd. And what you're going to do is export that out to a PDF. So you're going to basically print it to a PDF. All right, so that's how you generate a UML diagram. It's how you deal with ex, um, extending from classes. And hopefully that makes sense and you guys are ready to go on today's lab. Um, I will see you next week.